Well, hello. Praise the Lord. Come on in. Another Second Baptist Church Noonday Nugget. Starting to pray that all is well. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you again for this another day that thou has blessed us to be here. We are truly grateful. Bless now our time together. And then God will be so careful to give your name praise. All honor and glory shall be thine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So I don't... I guess I just want to just jump right on in today and not waste any time uh, covering the material that I hope to cover today as we uh, continue in our study of the end times and the last days. And I mentioned last week I tried to give an overview of what we were going to be discussing and we talked about the study of eschatology. As we know, it is a division of systematic theology uh, dealing with doctrines of the last days and the last times. And we uncovered that such things are, that's, that we're going to be looking at that is uh, relevant to the study of the last days, such as death and resurrection. Then the second coming of our Lord, the end of the age, the divine judgment, and then how we will look at future affairs, the state of affairs, upon Jesus' return to reign forever. Uh, there are parts that I want to methodically walk through without inundating us with confusion about following along in a way that we can get an appreciation for this uh, apocalyptic reading. Today I want to spend our time on the church age. That part of it, of course prior to that we know that the Antichrist is going to be released and we know after that how will you know when the Antichrist is um, on course or on time or making his or her grand entrance? How will you know? And that's a good question. Well, well first of all, as a part of unpacking the, the study of eschatology, the first thing is going to happen, or one of the first things is going to happen, is that we're going to be raptured up. It's what is called the rapture, which is another area that we will be looking at. And when you know that the Antichrist is on the warpath or manifesting himself and all that he leads, you will know. Because that's when we as associates, people we know, people we've grown up and have a relationship with, one day you're going to be in food line or Walmart somewhere. And all of a sudden, you're going to look around, and they're going to be gone. You might be gone. Um, it is there that 
The sound of the archangel has sound that the dead in Christ will be raised first. And then all who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And it is there that we as Christians and believers will receive our protection. We will be safeguarded under the arms of our Lord. And then this seven year tribulation period uh, will be ushered in. And tonight, or today, I, I really want to address the seven churches that God releases this revelation to Jesus and the angel delivers it to John. John is instructed by God to write it. And he now writes what God showed him as it relates to speaking to the seven churches throughout Asia Minor, that God had a specific message for each of them. And during this church age period, that there were some things that happened in each church being different. There were seven of them. And God had something specific, specifically to say to each of them. And so now he prepares to speak to the first church, which is Ephesus. And then he speaks to Smyrna. Then he speaks to Pergamon. Then he speaks to Thyatira. Then he speaks to Sardis. Then he speaks to Philadelphia. Then he speaks to Laodicea. And listing all of them, uh, my... I don't want to use my argument today so much is that in this review, I have found a particular error that has been omitted from the canon of the books that we are looking at. And I want to just sort of briefly jump over what really was said to each church, even though there was a particular approach that each of them, God starts off by commending them if there was anything that they had done to be commended for, while also he condemns them for their actions and the way they have carried on during that period. And then he offers recommendation to these churches upon uh, exploring the area where they did not measure up and whatever condemnation that he cites them for, that then in his recommendation would be to correct it. And then lastly, he, uh, he offers a challenge. The challenge there then becomes, what are we going to do or how we're going to shift, how we're going to realign ourselves with God, or how are we to correct the indictments that have been made, or at least to the seven churches that God sends this message parenthetically and specifically for. My argument tonight, if it is such an argument, but something came to me as I was looking and thinking about what would we talk about or how would we begin <clears throat> the unveiling of this apocalyptic book and to make it uh, simple for all who will listen to follow and to uh, disintegrate the myth that it is some undesired, unhappy uh, book to read because I oppose that view and rather want to highlight the joy and the beauty and the blessing of reading it. And as in the few times I have tried to share and facilitate in the unveiling of this narrative, uh, I believe God was perhaps prepping me then so that 
perhaps I might be more useful and objective now to have this conversation in this way, using this medium, since we're not able to come together no more, per se. But uh, all in all, God has given us uh, nuggets, or some referred to as golden bricks. <laughs> I like that. You know who you are. I, I really like that. So maybe uh, this should, you know, should change the name uh, Noonday Nuggets to Noonday Golden Bricks. <laughs> so we'll we'll continue with Nuggets right now, and whatever comes out of that moment and that experience, to God be the glory. So what I really want to pull out, not to go in any specifics about any of the churches, although we know God has something special to say to each of them concerning this church age review and evaluation of God and how he purports to send an angel to tell John to write what he saw in hopes that the church can improve and do better and more and, and, and find themselves and ourselves lining up with what God has brought to our attention by way of perhaps moving in a way that's not healthy for us or not beneficial for us. So we have to be man and woman enough to acknowledge our own um, transgression, if you will, and then be willing to try to make amends and posture ourselves before God that pleases him you know, posture ourselves in a way that pleases him by how we act, how we get along with one another, how we view God, how we view um, the study of the last days. Uh, what's going to become of my life when I close my eyes? What's going to, what, what there lies ahead for me? And all of this uh, sort of gives some insight and understanding of what that we all going to face. And somehow this may be a taboo topic or, you know, taboo. You know, we really don't want to talk about it. And maybe in sundry time, I didn't want to talk about it, perhaps because I wasn't prepared to talk about it. But I believe I'm more prepared now to talk about it than I have ever been before. And as I raised the question or the thought that we are now talking to seven churches, but in closing, I want to share a sight or a view that it's really eight. <laughs> yeah, there are eight periods in which the church has algamated to from uh, the time of Ephesus to where we are now. And one of the notable parts that I saw, and it just came to me, it is the piece where the incorporation of the text from John based on what he saw is that in every church there is a statement made. There is a collage of words used that would suggest to anybody or anyone reading and listening to the prophecy of this book what held ground then what has been holding throughout the church periods, the church ages in which we have come out of, and now a statement is made in every church that always seemed to close after he makes his indictment. And here it is. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. And we have defined that the church is not a building, but the church are you and me. The church is that when we become believers in Christ, that that's the church as Jesus had the conversation with Peter because Peter responded, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says to him, correct. And upon that rock, upon that faith, upon that understanding, I will now build my church. So we see church now coming into the picture with not just 
as the, the angel sent the message to the seven churches and then the statement, he that had an ear, let him hear what the spirit has to say to you. We are the church. So then what God was saying then, God is still saying now that God's word does not change. It's the same today, yesterday, and forever. The word of God does not change. And whatever reason why the incorporation of the words, he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit has to say to the church. So, I want to uh, at least build a case that it's not what we are hearing per se with our ears. Are you ready for this? Here, here, here is an exercise. You get ready? You, you ready? You listening? Now, no, no, you, you're all right. You, you're okay. It, it's not your Wi-Fi fading out on you. It's not that you're losing a signal because you heard me say you was giving, I was going to say something, but then all of a sudden you saw my lips move, but you didn't hear nothing. But that was an exercise because, see, that, that's how, when, when, when Jesus in this word is, I believe John was sending an encrypted message. And when the message go out and the message went out with each church, but there was an inclusion of each church to be all the same. He did not say in Ephesus, when he spoke to the church at Ephesus, that he did not say in Laodicea. In fact, he said it to every one of them. <laughs> Catch this. I believe that because we are the church, the ecclesia, the called out one, though we, though we when at, at, the, at, the, at the time of this, the origin of this text, in this apocalypse, when the when the message goes out, he's talking to seven literal churches throughout Asia Minor, and one might wonder why why was these churches selected? I don't know. That's God's prerogative. He he certainly had a good reason why he did what he did. But the point is that we are here today to read what took place then, and what he was saying then, he's still saying now. And though he speaks to seven eras, seven church ages, each of them were different. Different from Ephesus was the apostolic church. Smyrna was the persecuted church. Pergamon was the indulged church. Thyatira was the pagan church. Sardis was the dead church. Philadelphia was the church Christ love. Maybe that's why they got to be the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia, that's the church that God loved. And then there was the church of Laodicea. You know, the lukewarm church. Yeah. But I submit to you that there is there's another one that has been left out of the canon. <laughs> the, oh yeah, there's another one. And so I don't really want to talk so much about that as much as I will tell you or share with you some of my thoughts in that, although we're talking about seven, but it's really eight. Let me tell you why. Because when we come back to the statement that was made in every church, he that has an ear, let him hear. And I can verify that it was said in each of them. Revelation chapter one. Verse 7, he that had an ear, let him or hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. In Smyrna, verse 11, he that had an ear, let him or her hear what the Spirit has to say. In Thyatira, verse number 29, 
He that has an ear, let him or her hear what the Spirit has to say. Sardis, verse number 6. He that has an ear, chapter 3, of course. Let him hear what the Spirit has to say. Then, Philadelphia, chapter 3, verse 13. He that has an ear, let him or her hear what the Spirit has to say. Church of Laodicea, verse number 22. He that has an ear, let him or her hear what the Spirit has to say. Now, when I spoke of John sending encrypted message, and that for the believer has to decode the message, there may have been other encrypted, encoded messages that's a part of this study of eschatology. But I want to really give, give you, offer a, a, a giver. This is a given. For this particular one, I believe is inclusive of the encrypted message that John was communicating. Because what I noticed also that Jesus speaks in parable. He does not speak so everyone fully, clearly understand what he's saying. It's only uh, mentioned in parables so that the believer can grasp and interpret what the spirit of the living God is revealing. And there is affirmation and confirmation and validation for what you hear. Because the encoded message to the believer throughout Asia Minor as they were being tormented and tortured like savage beasts, that for the believer they went through a lot. And John was only in some way trying to reassure them and encourage them that they understand what is being communicated in the encrypted style or the encoding so that you can decode like Jesus speaks in parable. It is a earthly story that has a spiritual understanding. Come here a minute. There, there, there's another part to this, how we make now an inversion. Where on the carnal side, we see in the gospel that Jesus speaks and teaches in parables a earthly story that has a spiritual connotation. Now here in the book of the apocalypse, what is now being released as we walk methodically through this, we will see that John is now sending signs and codes. What was familiar with earthly story that has a spiritual connotation now what we see through the seal judgment and the trumpet judgment and even the bowl judgment that in each of them have their series of revelations. Now the revelation that we're now going to see in this apocalyptic book, it is now what God shows in heaven <laughs> that's going to occur and take place in the earth. That's my validation for believing that John's encrypted message or conversation to the church is to make sure when he says or as it is a part of the language that is used to communicate the divine revelation, what he saw while on the Isle of Patmos and God told him to write it and to write it so that there will be a record and to write it so that all of us who read it and hear it and do it. Blessed are we. And why would God say something that would contradict himself? If he says that we are blessed when we read it, so why should not we feel blessed when we do anything else? Because it's all in, I believe, that if we could catch on to hearing, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. To you. I mean, we are the ecclesia, the calling out one. We, we are, by definition, uh, we have enough faith to believe in the God who created us and the God that saved us all from our sin. And when we close our eyes to awake no more, I would think one would want to know what awaits us, what stands in the great beyond. What's there where John declared that I saw 
a new heaven, come down from above. There where Job declared that the wicked will cease from troubling and the weary will be at rest. So when the writer offers the language, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to you. It was meant, it was applicable then, and it is more applicable today. Now, I'm closing, I'm shutting it down because I really want to just uh, sort of whet your appetite so that we might have further discussions. I mean, we will come back tonight at 7 o'clock on our Zoom discussion and continue our discussions along these lines. And not to make it complicated, but rather we find a script and facilitate in the simplicity of uh, unfolding and the unveiling and the unpacking of this blessed book. And I'm excited and I'm encouraged to walk through it with you. If you would submit, if you would uh, uh, pray for us and, and, and be supportive, I believe only the sky is the limit to where God can take us and where we are well on our way right now. And I'm excited about it. In closing, let me say, uh, I said that it's eight periods in which the church has gone through, as I have named them, from Ephesus to Laodicea, seven churches. But we there's another era beyond the persecuted age, beyond the indulged church, beyond the church age that uh, lost their first love. But we are now uh, in another era the era called um, the Corona Age. Corona Age. And I'm very clear on that since this pandemic, God has shut so many things down, including the church. Because maybe could that be a metaphor and God said it's time for another church age to enter and that as we listen to the word of God he or she that has an ear let them him or her hear what the spirit of God has to say to you and I don't mean with your physical natural ears but I'm talking about the spears, the spirit of the living God, those ears that allows us to hear God speak to us, cause us to move from our present location because somewhere he has provided a destiny for all of us. Are you ready for the trip? Are you ready for the journey? This is just the beginning of the unfolding and the unveiling of the blessings and the promises of God. I never felt so empowered, so confident in what the Lord has laid on our hearts to share. And along the lines of the study of eschatology, we're well on our way. Thank you. Next time we come, we'll be talking about the rapture. And, uh, I think that would be interesting to know what lies ahead waiting until our Lord comes back for us. Thank you for your time. Continue to pray for us as I always pray for you. Let this day be the best day for the rest of your life. Love one another. Lift one another up. Encourage one another. My brothers and sisters, greater things lies ahead for all of us who believe. Peace.